Part 1. You will hear Kevin Brown asking for information about renting an apartment through an agency. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon. How can I help you? Hello. My name's Kevin Brown. I saw your advertisement in today's local paper, Apartments to Let in All Areas of the City. Yes, Mr Brown. Uh, we currently have several properties available. What part of the city were you thinking of? Well, city centre, ideally. OK. And what price range are you interested in? Um, I don't really know. What have you got? Well, uh, prices start at £400 a month, going up to £1,000 a month. OK. And what's the difference? What does the price depend on? Well, uh, the number of bedrooms mainly. Uh -huh. The cheaper apartments have one bedroom, while the most expensive have three or four bedrooms. OK. Two bedrooms would be nice. So I'll say two bedrooms up to 600 a month. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything like that? Right, sir. We have... Uh, just give me a moment, please. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have two properties that might interest you. One is in North Street... It's, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a very nice apartment, uh, but it's £750 a month. Uh, but that includes a private parking space. Hmm, £750. That's a bit higher than I'd like to go, really. Do you have anything less expensive? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, we have another one at £625 a month. £625? Mm -hmm. All right, that sounds interesting. Where is it? It's in Cornell Road, at number 12B. I don't know that. How do you spell it? It's C-O-R-N-E-L-L. -L. It's near the park. I've never heard of it, but I'm sure I'll be able to find it on a map. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. So, would you like to see the apartment, sir? Yes, I would. I'd like to rent somewhere fairly soon. Mm -hmm. Would tomorrow be possible? Uh, uh, sorry, I'm afraid nobody is available all day tomorrow. It's quite a busy time of year for us. I see. But if you're free later today, you could see it at 5.15. Sure, no problem. I could manage that. OK. So that'll be uh, 5.15 with my colleague Jason. Mm. He'll meet you at the apartment. That's fine. And one more thing. What do I need to provide to rent an apartment with you? What documents, that kind of thing? Yes, of course. Um, do you have a job? Yes, I work in a travel agency. Well, uh, a reference letter from your employer, you know, saying you work for them, and a deposit, which is one month's rent plus a fee of £60. What's that for? It's an administration fee to cover the cost of preparing the contract. OK. And one last thing. When would this apartment be available? It's empty now, so you could move in as soon as the contract was signed. That's great. Thanks very much indeed. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Brown. <laughs> that is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. Listen to the guided tour commentary and answer questions eleven to twenty. You now have some time to read questions eleven to twenty first. Welcome to the library tour. We'll begin our tour of this level of the library here at the entrance. Then we'll go in a clockwise direction. So, first of all, over here on the left, next to the entrance, is a touchscreen information service. These computers can be used at any time to get general information about the library and how it works. In front of the touchscreen information service are the catalogues. As you can see, it's a computerised catalogue system, and it's very easy to use. The catalogues are linked up to the other libraries at the university, so make sure you check which library a book is in when you are trying to locate a particular item. Next, along here on the left, we have the circulation desk for borrowing and returning books. The returns area. The place for returned books and other items is at the end of the circulation desk near closed reserve. Closed reserve, as most of you probably know, is a collection of books that are in high demand, so they are on restricted circulation. If a book is on closed reserve, you can only borrow it to use within the library for three hours at a time. Over there in the corner are the shelves for newspapers. The library has an extensive collection of local and international English language newspapers. They are kept on those shelves for one month and then stored elsewhere. As we continue on our tour, around to the right, this large central section is the reference section. Reference texts cannot be borrowed for use outside the library. They must be used within the library. All these shelves in the centre of this level are the reference section. Now, the stairs here on the left lead to level two only. On level two are most of the law books. To go up to the other levels of the library, you have to use a lift. Beside the stairs are the restrooms for this floor. Now, as we walk around this corner to the right, this large room on the left is the audiovisual resource centre. You can come here if you wish to listen to a tape or watch one of the library's videos. Next to the audio visual resource center is the photocopying room. There are 15 copiers for student use, and we've recently added a color copier. The system for copying uses cards, not coins. You can buy a photocopy card from the technician in charge of the photocopying room. Or from the information desk if he isn't here at the time. On our right, these work tables are for student use, especially for small groups to work together. Or you and your colleagues can use the conference room, which is that small room there next to the lockers. You can work on group projects in the conference room without disturbing anyone. And there's a conference room on each level of the library. The round desk in front of the lockers is the information desk. If you need help using the catalogues, or you need to organise a loan from another library, the information desk is the place to come. And finally, here beside the exit doors, these two shelves contain current magazines and journals. Like the newspapers, they are kept here for a time and then stored elsewhere. Okay, that's the end of the tour of this level of the library. I'll leave you to look around yourselves now, and if you need any further help, please ask at the information desk. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation on rivers. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Please tell me about the current state of the Amazon. We have increased deforestation, increased human population relating to deforestation, and a role of fire in the Amazon on a scale that's never been seen in history. At the same time, you can see progress in trying to counter that negative trend. How do you see this? We see this in the creation of national parks and indigenous areas. And efforts to fund sustainable development activities for locals, we see both good and the bad, and it's going to be a race to finish. I understand that you started the minimum critical size of ecosystems project. Could you tell me about it? A number of years ago, it became apparent that those practicing conservationists didn't have the scientific information available to properly design a conservation area. They didn't know how big it had to be, right? People were learning that as forests fragment, the fragments begin to shed species after they become isolated. So they end up becoming poor examples of what they had been. This relates to the size of the fragment. Do people still study this? Yes, there is a rich subfield of conservation biology that looks at the efforts of fragmentation. One of the consequences is a general policy response to set up protected areas that are fairly large. Something on the order of one thousand square kilometers. Now look at questions twenty-six to thirty. As the talk continues, answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Can you talk a little bit more about the forest fragmentation? As habitats are destroyed, they are accompanied by habitat fragmentation. So, when fifty percent of a forest is lost, the remaining fifty percent being is not one large block, but smaller pieces, which makes the conservation problem even worse than saying that fifty percent has been lost. And this affects not just forest but species diversity, correct? In terms of species loss, we can't give you precise numbers about how many species are lost because of these fragmented landscapes. But we're beginning to get close to where we can make that estimation. And so, one of the policy responses to all of this, beyond just trying to create large protected areas, is to try and reconnect the fragments. You've been active in many projects studying the Amazon region over the years. Can you tell us about that process of understanding the Amazon? When people first started looking at conservation priorities, there was not much information about the geography of plant and animal species. One of the first clues was an analysis done in 1969. This looked at bird species and found geographic clusters of species which occurred nowhere else. And those are priority areas for conservation. Was this when people began prioritizing refuges? Yes, it was the first time that someone looked basin-wide at priorities, giving priority to so-called refugee areas. Was this when the new trend to use geographic information systems, or a GIS, started? That was in 1990, after we worked out a whole set of biological and conservational priorities and produced a big map using GIS. What are some of the things that GIS does? Well, there are several advantages of using a geographic information system. First, you can continually update the system so that it's now a constantly changing picture. You can actually watch changes. Then you can include large amounts of data. Including information about the vectors of development. 
roads, railroads, pipelines, hydroelectric projects, etc. And finally, because it is accessible on the internet, it makes this information available to anyone who's interested. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. In this section, you'll hear a lecture on coral reef. First, you have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully to the lecture and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Do you fancy diving in the wonderful world of coral reefs, green sponges, colourful fish, and red crabs? It is a rich garden beneath the waves. But how much do you know about the corals? Are they animals or plants? What are the threats to coral reefs? Today, Mr. Tim Harford, executive director of the Coral Reef Alliance. Is going to introduce the facts about coral reefs. Good afternoon, everyone. Coral reefs are one of nature's most magnificent creations. It is filled with thousands of unique and valuable plants and animals. Over one quarter of all marine species depend on healthy coral reefs. Humans also depend on coral reefs. These marine ecosystems are the primary source of food and income for millions of people. A vast repository of valuable chemical compounds and medicines, and a natural wave barrier that protect beaches and coastlines from waves and storms. Coral is actually the exoskeletons of coral polyps, made from limestone. These skeletons build up over time, forming the reef. New corals are born each April. At a certain hour on a certain night. Mature corals suddenly release clouds of eggs and sperm into the sea. After the fertilized eggs take root on the sea floor, they can grow up to fifteen centimeters per year. Coral reefs are present in the waters of over one hundred countries. These are warm, eighteen to twenty-nine degrees centigrade, shallow, sunny regions, primarily between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Only clear, warm salt water can support a coral reef, and because sunlight is crucial to the reef's survival, the water must also be shallow. The algae that grow on coral provide much of the coral's food. In deeper water, algae cannot get the sunlight they need to grow. Most coral reefs are in the tropics because natural conditions there are perfect. In their modern form. Coral reefs have thrived on Earth for over fifty million years. In recent years, however, more than eleven percent of the world's reefs have been lost, with another sixteen percent severely damaged during the El Nino event in 1998. Up to thirty-two percent of coral reefs may be destroyed by human activities in the next thirty years if we do not take action now. Corals and coral reefs are extremely sensitive. Slight changes in the reef environment may have detrimental effects on the health of entire coral colonies. These changes may be due to a variety of factors. One of the greatest threats to coral reefs is human expansion or development. As human population increases, so does the harvest of resources from the sea. Due to overfishing, reef fish populations have been greatly decreased in some areas of the world. The removal of large numbers of reef fish has caused the coral reef ecosystems to become unbalanced. 
As we know, corals are also very popular as decorations. A large amount of the most healthy corals are selected by commercial collectors. They sell the corals to souvenir shops, where a large number of tourists wait to purchase them as decorations or souvenirs. Coral reefs also receive much damage from both commercial and private vessels. The leakage of fuels into the water and the occurrence of spills by large tankers are extremely damaging to local corals. Although much of the coral reef's degradation is directly blamed on human impact, there are several natural disturbances which cause significant damage to coral reefs. The most recognised of these events are hurricanes or typhoons, which bring powerful waves to the tropics. These storm waves cause large corals to break apart and scatter fragments about the reefs. Home to a diverse community of creatures, coral reefs are underwater treasure chests of colour and activity. Predators and prey swim and crawl among the coral in nature's never-ending dance of life and death. This lively, fascinating world beneath the waves is just waiting to be explored. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.